Redditors in healthcare what is something you never thought you would have to tell another grown but human? Number. I cannot tell the race of your baby on ultrasound. You'll have to wait until birth to have an awkward conversation with one of your boyfriends. Pretty frequently have to explain to patients that they can't have metal in on their bodies during an MRI. Even if the jewelry whatever is on a different part of their body than what is being imaged. But I'm only getting an MRI of my foot. Why do I have to take my earrings out? Because the magnet affects the entire room, and it will RIP your earrings out and throw them around the room. Also people who have pacemakers who are peed off when we don't let them have an MRI, because they think it won't be any big deal. Sorry, I know you really want the best possible imaging for your back pain, but we really don't want to kill you to get it. Really, doctors need to be screening their patients for things like that before scheduling them for an MRI. But you'd be shocked how much it happens. I know you are trying to help but you don't do CPR on someone who is actively telling you to stop between compressions. Shut up. I'm trying to save your life. Why showering regularly is important. I am a home health physical therapist. It wasn't till I started using Reddit that I discovered just how many people don't realize you have to wash your butt. The water trucking down during the shower isn't enough. Paramedic here. I had a PT once who was complaining of being unable to sleep. He's telling me all these different things he's been trying in order to sleep. You know basic things like counting backward, counting sheep, melatonin, NyQuil, Benadryl, Zquil, warm milk, alcohol, weed, and M. This has been going on for about 2 weeks. Wait a minute, M. So I proceed to ask how long they've been on M. I started like 2 weeks ago when my GF showed me. At this point I thought this 47 year old man would catch on. But nope. Not even a flicker of a light bulb. So I say to him. You realize M can cause insomnia it was as though I removed a bottle of stupid juice he was drinking. And opened up a can of acme knowledge because he responded oh my god that makes so much sense. Cause I was even smoking M to try and sleep yeah this productive member of society went straight to the waiting room. Yes, you smoking in your house is likely making your kids asthma worse. My mother in law went off on me for giving my 12 year old brother in law ice cream after dark, but he has asthma, you'll give him an attack. Cut to 5 minutes later, we're all in the living room and two people are smoking. Yes, it's the ice cream. Don't hide bottles of 5 hour energy in your bag. My PT came in with a complaint of vaginal foreign body. Doc goes in to do the pelvic exam. Pulls out an opened, sealed bottle of 5 hour energy. Cue her explanation of hiding it from her spouse because he doesn't like for her to drink energy drinks. Then she asks for it back so she can drink it. IT's not a pocket. Don't douche with bleach. Patient had mixed bleach, fabric softener, dawn dish soap vinegar, and some water, just in case, and burned the bejesus out of herself after having a baby 3 weeks prior because she was convinced people could smell her. She douched with it multiple times and came in when the burning toned down. Sent off to gynecological surgeon and never seen again. Intercourse makes babies. Okay, so maybe not as succinct. You would be shocked at the number of calls related to abdominal pain turn out to be pregnancy even after asking the patient if there is any chance they are pregnant and they answer number. Older man, terminally ill, New Year's Eve, presented to the ear in the company of an escort. He had a finishing nail in his erect dong. He was into penile sounding. He says, well, there was nothing else laying round, and I'm so fricked up and can't feel a thing. Indeed, he was fricked up. Coke, alcohol, and ma, Viagra and some hydrocodone. Poor dude just wanted one last rager. I told him, wood is just a euphemism, man. Don't shove sharp things up your pee hole. He took it in stride. He was in the hospital for two days. The escort basically stayed with him the entire time. Come to find out, she was only one of the three escorts he had paid. She wasn't even the one who shoved the nail up there. I thought it odd that she hung around until he told me how much he had paid them. Turns out the other two were hanging out at his house waiting for his return. I visited him before he was discharged. Dude pops some X right in front of me and says, Just getting a head start. No more sharp crap. I promise. Doc. I worked in hospital administration for nearly 2 years. 
while working on something I decided to take a break and go down to the cafeteria to get something to eat and not look at number. While there, a woman was on the phone with someone and was pretty openly talking about how she kept drinking the night before surgeries to calm her nerves and how she thought it was ridiculous that the doctors couldn't wouldn't just pump her stomach so they could get the surgery started. Now I don't know all of the details on what she was getting done, nor was I there for her presumed tirade on our doctors as she was prepped for whatever it is she needed done, but I am grateful I wasn't. She continued this conversation for probably a minute with her friend completely oblivious to how ridiculous she sounded. Don't lick your contact lenses to clean them. Seriously. I work in health information management currently. I get to explain to parents that even though they are biological I still can't share information about your adult kid about a half dozen times a day. Nurse here. I have to explain daily to patients that they can't eat before an operation. They're always saying things like but if I ate and had an accident wouldn't they operate on me I have to explain that in case of life and death situations the doctor takes some risks but why risk during a routine operation? I worked in obstetrics for many years. I was taking care of a woman in her late 20s. Definitely not a teen mom. Married. With a job. She got to 10 centimeters, so I did my usual speech about how to push effectively. She nods and pushes when I tell her and she did great. Really moved the baby down. I'm excited but I notice she's whispering to her husband. He looks at me and says so why do you want her to do that? I was a bit taken aback and very slowly explained that she had to that to get the baby out. She asked if I was kidding. At this point I feel like I'm the butt of a practical joke, but it didn't stop. He kept asking if there wasn't a better way to do it and muttering that I was being ridiculous. She continued to push and thankfully didn't take long because she kept rolling her eyes at me. I was thrilled to hand this lovely couple off to the doctor. They looked slightly more convinced when he told her to do exactly what I had told her to do and then a baby magically appeared. If she'd ended up in a c-section I'm sure she'd have been convinced I had done it all to torture her. How does a woman make it into adulthood in normal society without knowing you have to push a baby out? And then there was the time a woman got mad when I told her there was absolutely no way we could do her caesarean laparoscopically. Literally every show movie that depicts women giving birth has this exchange. A few minutes of, nurse, push, push, pregnant lady, I can't push anymore, nurse boyfriend whoever, yes you can, one more push, baby, whatever. No, your teenage daughters cannot share a single prescription for birth control pills. You need to wash your hands. Don't frick your wife's colostomy hole. It's been years since I learned of a new fetish, so thank you. I took care of a paraplegic as a home. Health RN. She was young, and she was attractive. She lived with her boyfriend and kept getting uties. This isn't uncommon. She had a catheter and it's something that can be very hard for this population. Well, this patient was talking to me about her intimate life and told me her boyfriend liked anal. She has no feeling below the waist. Then it hit me. I asked if he's going from anal to vaginal. She said she wasn't sure. So I went and asked him. I had to tell them both that is probably what is causing her uties. They can't go from anal to vaginal. So, that's what I charted patient education was that day. I had to call her urologist and primary care to let them know we probably found the issue. We all tried to be professional but there was lots of awkward laughing. Usually goes along with after a car accident and their kids weren't in car seats seat belts. How their kids need to be in freaking car seats. But it's summer so a more seasonal example is the following. Me so what's the problem today? Them I don't know what's going on. I can't breath. I'm having a seizure. Me hum. Has this ever happened before? T.A. usually when I smoke crystal M. Me did you smoke crystal M today? T.A. Like 30 minutes ago. Why? Me. Patient had been referred to my pharmacy by his physician for an OTC enema. The guy was not the sharpest tack. And apparently either his physician did not explain it well or the guy didn't listen. But our conversation went like this. PT. So I drink down this whole bottle and then I'll have to crap? Me. No sir. This is an enema. It is used rectally. PT. Confused. So what's that mean? I don't have to drink the whole thing? Me. No sir. 
you will lie on your side and insert the applicator tip of the bottle into your rectum and squeeze the contents into your bowel. You'll then remain lying on your side and hold the enema in until you feel the urge to have a bowel movement. PT. You telling me I gotta stick it up my butt? Me. Yes sir. This is an enema and it is used rectally. There are detailed instructions and diagrams in the box. PT. Frick you. And he stormed off. That was the last I saw of him. Not sure if he thought I was messing with him or what, but I hope he eventually got to crap. Well, conversely, when I got the prep stuff for my colonscopy, the pharmacist made it a point to tell me several times that it was an oral medication and not a suppository. I can only imagine what precipitated that one. Worked in an optical practice in the UK. Man comes in complaining of bad vision. His astigmatism has increased by like 3 diopters. That's a frick load and definitely shouldn't happen. Optician retested using different kit. Same result. Told him to come back in a week and we will retest it. This time we're looking at 4 diopters. They freak out. Recheck again. Another optician checks it. Same result. They run through health. Smoking. Drinking. Medicine. Nothing out of the ordinary. The guy looks stressed as crap. Put his head in his hands and put his thumbs against the side of his eyes. The optician asks if he does that a lot. Apparently whenever he's stressed he pushes the sides of his eyes. He's done it so much that he has physically changed the front of his eyeball and ruined his vision. We told him to stop doing that. Never thought we'd have to tell another human being to not squeeze their own eyeballs. Also had to tell a kid to not look at laser pointers. But he was just dumb as crap. I don't know how much pressure is required to create this problem, but now I am paranoid about rubbing my eyes. Old friend of mine is a nurse practitioner. She told me she once saw a patient, male, complaining of severe rectal itching and general pain. She is a very smart people person. She can read people very well. She got right to the point and asked him about his daily hygiene routine. She had a hunch based off his presentation that he was a manned man. Ain't no gay stuff happening here. Long story short, when showering, he never cleaned his butt, ever. He told her that it was gay to touch his anus. She had to explain to him that the severe rash and itching he had been dealing with for apparently years was a direct result of his perceived homo acts. She instructed him to go home, take a proper shower, and apply witch hazel for a few days. Amazing that a grown man thinks this way. I'm amazed by the logic that it's gay to wash your crack but somehow not to touch your own dong. What's an appropriate reason to dial 9? 1. 1. Private ambulance services. No. It's not okay to call 9. 1. 1. Because your boyfriend won't take his jacket off. And no calling us directly. Private ambulance. Isn't appropriate either. A lady in my building called 9. 1. 1 because her son had nasal congestion. WTF. No. Belly button lint is not a reason to go to the emergency room via ambulance. You're 22. Wash your dong. That you need to take the packaging off the suppository before you insert it. Which in retrospect, is why they were making his piles worse. When I worked at CVS it was our policy to change insert to unwrap and insert on all pre-generated suppository instructions. Me. Do you have any medical problems? PT. Nope. Me. Do you take any medications? PT. Yes. I take metformin, levothyroxine, coumadin, metoprolol, silis, etc. Me. So you are diabetic, have thyroid issues, take a nulli blood thinner, have high blood pressure etc. Question mark? PT. Well no. Not since I started taking my meds. I had to tell a patient that food cooked in restaurants does in fact have salt, sodium. He was under the impression that they just didn't IDK. I was like, no dude, that's why their food tastes good. Me. Did you miss a dose of insert medicine name here? PT. No. I take it every day. Me. How many times did you not take previously named medicine in the past week? PT. 3 and I skipped this morning too. This happens probably once a week. The amount of people who skip their diabetes or hypertension meds because they don't feel hyperglycemic or hypertensive is mind-boggling. The three that come to mind for me are 1. 
trying to explain to a patient why it probably wasn't a good idea to eat a container of cottage cheese that had been sitting out on the counter all night. 2. The entire family of a lady with a pacemaker. They kept insisting that she did not have a history of heart problems. They were convinced that because the pacemaker helped her, that it meant she no longer had any kind of heart problem. 3. Family with a mom that was 650 pounds. And if they wanted to move her anywhere, they would have to call the fire department. They were always apologetic and such and said they just didn't know why she was so heavy and that she's tried everything to lose weight. But all around her bed is nothing but Butterfinger, Babe Ruth, Reese Cup packages, fast food bags. I'm like, she can't walk on her own. Bring her a salad. All this junk and no movement is why she's so heavy. My mom is a nurse and had to teach these parents how to read a clock. Their baby wasn't eating enough because they didn't know when it's time to feed him. It's not okay to crap the bed just because you don't want to walk 10 feet to the bathroom said to a fully coherent and independent patient that decided she would rather just have the staff clean her up and change the sheets. Wife had a baby. The process involved about 100 professionals telling never to shake my baby. Of course, I thought. Everyone knows that. Wife's water breaks. We are in the hospital. And she's getting checked in. I'm there with two other soon to be fathers. A nurse comes by and almost casually starts giving us a basic rundown of what not to do. Stuff I've heard a hundred times. We get to never shake your baby. And one guy looks confused. A bewildering conversation takes place where this man insists he's never heard of that. Must be cultural differences. Insist everyone where he came from was shaken. And eventually is led away to talk to the doctor. I never saw him again. But I'm still scared for that baby. P does not come out the bag. P is stored in the balls. We all know this. I took on the nurse role at a camp once and had to tell a bunch of kids not to put hand sanitizer in their urethras. To a girl once that she needed the morning after pill because she thought that girls only have babies if they think really hard to have one. That's some wishful thinking right there. A couple instances come to mind. 1. Don't have intercourse 6 hours after you delivered a baby. 2. Coffee creamer is not the same as infant formula. Please do not feed your day old newborn international delight. 3. Probiotics are different from antibiotics. Probiotics do not cure syphilis. I am a clinical lab scientist, and I frequently have to tell patients that I cannot accept their stool samples in Tupperware, mugs, food to go boxes, etc. The worst is when they take the crap filled mug back home with them cause they don't want to lose a perfectly good mug. Yes, you are pregnant, I'm holding a head with my hand, as she's screaming it's not possible, mum saying the same thing, as she called her mum, guess they found out it was possible. Had a partner try to threaten to take our patient out of the hospital because she was in increasing pain and we weren't stopping fixing it. Note, she was in labor and minutes away from delivering. Had to explain that leaving now would not help her pain as it's normal to increase as labor progresses and by leaving we would have to remove the epidural and that would definitely make pain worse. Note, we had zero plans of actually doing any of this. But still had to point out how stupid his logic was. There was no way we would let someone who's about to deliver to walk out. Like close enough we check between legs to make sure no surprise baby on the bed level close to delivering. Luckily her mom showed up a few minutes later and very quickly put him in his place. He tried to brag to her about how he was threatening to leave. Going for tough guy macho type persona. And she told him to either shut up or wait down in lobby. The number of guys I've spoken to who genuinely think that a woman in labor goes immediately to hospital where they completely and instantly stop all her pain and get the baby out within a few minutes is disturbing. <laughs> Nurse here. The number of people I've had to tell to not drink or to stop drinking their urine is surprising. <laughs> is more about medication. Antibiotics only work against bacteria. They are not some kind of wonder potion that cures anything. And they should not always be given. Please please stick to your prescription the doctor gives you. Even if you already feel better, don't just stop unless the doctor says you can stop. A lot of medication needs to be taken according to the prescription in order for it to be effective, because you build up the doses to an effective level. Stopping or not sticking to it really decreases effectivity. Tell us what drugs and alcohol you're on. We aren't gonna tell the cops. We aren't gonna lecture you. 
but it might change the anesthesia I give you. Some stuff I give you might kill you. If you drink a 30 pack a day, tell me. Ejaculating blood happens to most people at least once in their lives and in 99% of cases it resolves without taking any action within a week. It doesn't even warrant a doctor visit. Peeing blood, for both sexes, is a serious medical emergency and you should immediately go to the air. People think it's the other way around. How to eat healthy. Just because you're skinny doesn't mean you're healthy. Especially the teenagers who I take care of. Sometimes I will ask them what's a healthy food your doctor wants you to eat. Rarely do I get a right answer. I feel like the internet has so many fad diets. And family members rarely cook. So families don't know basic nutrition facts. If you could keep track of the assorted parts you've had removed or added. That'd be very helpful. I'm not saying you need to know whether your fund application was a Nissan or a door, but if you're complaining about belly pain it would be nice to know that the last time you had belly pain they took out your gallbladder appendix sigmoid colon. And if you've ever had something implanted, and they gave you a little card, that's not warranty information. That tells us if you're going to explode if you go in an MRI. Bring it, otherwise it will be googled. That there is a wide range of normal. Don't be embarrassed by your body. Having said that, if you are concerned about anything, ask your doctor. We have generally heard it all before. And trust me, we have, nearly always, seen it all before. Maybe you have something that has been bothering you for ages, but you were too scared or embarrassed to ask about it. Just ask. It might be nothing and you have been stressing about it for no reason. And if not, then you are at least one step closer to getting it fixed. No one can help if they don't know. There are no stupid questions, so ask away. I'm always amazed when I have been asked about something that has been bothering a patient for years and years, but they were too embarrassed scared to bring it up. Most of the time, it is nothing a completely normal body function feature. Other times, it is something that should have been discussed right away. You know your body best, so speak up. Don't wait for the doctor to ask the right question. Some people seem to think that if you act healthy for a bit, it'll make up for being a wreck. There are so many things wrong with this. Just one example, antioxidants are like gas for your car. You can store up a certain amount of vitamins, but your tank can only hold so much. If you binge and overfill your tank, it doesn't do anything. You excrete it out as waste, and you can't expect to go the next several months without gas just because you tried to overload it before. You're going to still need to get gas. Same goes for your fruits and veggies. Had someone tell me he went vegetarian for a few weeks, which meant he was done for the year. He was dead serious. Had a patient at risk for heart failure try to insist that if she stayed away from salt entirely for x days weeks, she should be able to have her fill of McDonald's fries and ramen. Had a smoker argue that if he stopped for some time, he should be able to smoke freely for a while. With some digging, stopping turned out to mean a couple less cigarettes a day. My phone is acting up, so if this has already been posted I apologize. But women, please do not use soap or douching products inside your vagina. It has a delicate pH balance and this is how you get yeast infections. Wash your labia, but do not clean internally. The vagina is self-cleaning just like your eyeballs. Do you wash your eyeballs? Number. Do you wash your face? Yes. Don't do DIY surgery or hold off on reporting things that are obvious warning signs. Don't be the guy who tried to remove his skin cancer with a knife. Doctors hate him. They really do. You need some kind of exercise. Doesn't matter how you feel right now. Sitting for 12-16 hours a day will have negative consequences. Your kidneys and liver cheerfully do all the toxin elimination you'll ever need. Cleanses and other detoxifying products are bulls woo and a waste of money. The people who sell them are predators who only care about your money becoming theirs. Type 2 diabetes is more serious than most people realize. I work as a doctor in hemodialysis and most of them are due to diabetic nephropathy. It also affects your eyes nerves immune system etc. Simple life changes can help you but no one seems to care. I even lost 9 kilograms myself because I had a family history of diabetes and to be healthy. How to check for skin cancer. If you see any moles or anything that are asymmetrical. B. Border. Odd borders. Like they're jagged or something. C. 
color different colors. D. Diameter. Grows. E. Evolve. Well. Evolves. Go get it checked out. It might be skin cancer. There is no cure for cancer as it is traditionally thought about. Cancer is a class of many many very different diseases, each with very specific causes, i.e. some molecule that went wrong allowing a cell to multiply out of control. Even within the same type of cancer, i.e. lung cancer, there are many types of lung cancer, such as small cell, large cell, squamous cell etc. Even within the same subtype of cancer, there can be different molecular mechanisms that caused it, requiring different approaches to treatment. Looking for the cure for cancer is like looking for the cure for disease. That administering CPR compressions ASAP is one of the greatest indicators of successful outcomes. Had a guy roll in post Torsard's arrest. The guy behind him at the DMV when he went down was an IQ nurse who started compressions within seconds and got the ED attached. Patient came in talking with his only complaint being chest pain from the compressions. I wouldn't have believed it if the medics hadn't given me the rhythm strip. Where the orifice each gender urinates through really is. Antibiotics are not some magic cure for every pain in your body, nor for the flu or common cold. Never ever boil breast milk. In my country there is a popular belief that breast milk jaundice in newborns can be treated by boiling one's breast milk. But by doing this you destroy all the nutrients and it basically becomes as nutritious as water is. Do not give honey to children below the age of 1. Do not rub your child with rubbing alcohol as to lower his fewer. Baby wipes don't substitute daily bath showers. Yes, I am a pediatrician. Antibiotics are not some magic cure for every pain in your body, nor for the flu or common cold. This is a common belief among my peers, which is weird, because I'm a biology major and you'd think biology majors would know this. This is going to sound really basic, but I wish my patients would know what meds they are on when they come to the hospital. At least once a day comes somebody in who goes yeah I take 8 pills in the morning, 3 in the evening, and 4 at lunch but don't ask me which. You're a doctor, you should know. I beg of you, before going to a doctor that has never seen you before, write your meds, doses and all on a piece of paper. I'm a vet, but I'm sure some doctors will have come across this too. Amputated limbs do not grow back. I've had far too many people asking how long it will take for their pet's amputated limb to grow back. So I'm assuming a few doctors out there will have had patients asking the same of their own missing limbs. Maybe those people you've met think all animals are like lizards. JK. I think sometimes, it's shock or fear of what might be ahead and how things might change that makes people say that. And then again, some are just stupid or ignorant. Also, thanks for what you do as a vet, taking care of vulnerable creatures. You often will feel normal even with high blood pressure. It's often found incidentally, so don't wait until it gives you symptoms you don't want to go through. Your mental health is just as important as your physical health. You only get one body. The way you treat it has a significantly higher impact in how your health will end up in a decade than what sort of interventions we can give you. You really should treat your body like a temple. That the immune system is an incredibly complex and nuanced organization of cells that communicates readily to destroy anything deemed hostile within the body. It helps explain why vaccines are supposed to work, why allergies come and go, and why transfusions transplants are hard to successfully pull off. My immune system is so complex, it attacks my own body, good times, good times. I'm a dentist and if you don't take care of your gums your teeth will fall out of your head and you'll get pee at me when your jawbone atrophies and your denture doesn't fit anymore. Baby doctor here, about to graduate, unless you have liver or kidney failure, your body detoxes itself really well, but don't get scammed by these detox teas and whatever. Can we put this on the front page of everything? My mom tells her teen patient's parents alert that the acne isn't the teen's fault but runs in the genes sometimes when it's bad. Injuries accumulate. I cannot stress this enough. Little kids have no business lifting heavy weights or getting pushed so hard in sports by some of these coaches who seem to have little knowledge of physiology or don't care about the long term impact of the regiments. Stuff like this really changes people's lives. That they only have one in their behavior now. Drinking, smoking, not taking medicines, 
or whatever will impact their life quality and expectancy. Sounds logical, but very few patients really realize it. High blood pressure doesn't have symptoms majority of the time. It's called the silent killer and causes a plethora of other illnesses. Holy crap. This needs to be SR. Kids stop getting those magnet piercings on your mouth. Every week a dozen idiots come in swallowing them. Once in a blue moon we have to take them to theater. Open them up and fish them out. The issue is if they don't come out by you crapping them. There's a risk they make a hole in your bowel. Fistula. And it becomes an emergency. That's why we'd rather fish them out before we have to cut out bits of your bowel. I'm not a doctor, but as someone that works with those who may be in a psychotic break, get sleep. Most psychosis happens because someone haven't had slept or haven't had good sleep for extended periods of time. Some people just need 20 straight hours of sleep and then they never end up in a psychiatric hospital ever again. And don't just randomly stop your medication because you feel better. You feel better because you have consistent amount of whatever is leveled in your body now. And now that your body is hitting equilibrium everything is going great. So keep doing what you're doing. I've seen people go on and off their medications for years and it really starts to mess up your body if you do that for too long. It's okay to seek treatment for your mental health. Don't feel ashamed because you were diagnosed with an illness. Seeking help is a strength, not a weakness. That psychological states may infuse bodily symptoms, and that saying so isn't dismissing that the symptoms exist. I think it just needs to be worded carefully because very easily it can be misconstrued as it's all in your head. But people don't really understand the mind-body connection. In males, there is a vestigial remnant of the uterus located in the prostate. It's called the prostatic utricle. It is a duct that leads nowhere. It sometimes has some remote endometrium in it and can produce one drop of blood every 28 days. Source, embryology professor in med school. So yeah, guys can get PMS too. But it's probably better to call it BMS, or bromenstrual syndrome. I call it menstruation. Take care of your kidney. If your renal function is shot, it closes the door on so many options. Actually a doctor. I wish people would know that when I say, I don't think CPR is in your your relative's best interests. I am not saying I am going to withdraw all treatment immediately. CPR is brutal, and it has a much lower success rate, even if done promptly in hospital, than the movies make out. If you are old, or have a lot of medical problems, then the success rate goes down even more. If I don't want to do CPR on you it's not because I want you to die, it's because I don't want to fracture your ribs. Expose your body to a huge group of people you don't know everyone loves attending a crash call, and repeatedly assault your dead body for nothing. I want you to die with dignity and care if there is no chance of bringing you back. In summary, CPR is great and everyone should learn how to do it, it does save lives. But, if a doctor suggests it should not be performed, please give serious thought to that. We don't suggest a DNA CPR for no reason. This time's a thousand. 90% of arrests I've been to have been on patients that shouldn't have been resuscitated. It's horrific. Teeth are the most disrespected body part. A healthy set is as important as a healthy heart. Infective endocarditis is a thing too. Not a doctor but, never flush unused medicine down the toilet or throw it in the trash, especially not antibiotics. Hand them back into your pharmacy and they will destruct them. Neonatal provider checking in here. Feed your dang baby. The badge of honor you get for exclusively breastfeeding isn't real. Dehydration. Severe hyperbilirubinemia. Hypoglycemia. These are all real and happen all the time. Feed your baby. Lots of hospitals will even let you use donor breast milk initially if you are strongly opposed to formula. Just feed your baby. And don't use a cup or a spoon. The lactation consultants will tell you that babies know how to lap it up. Well, you didn't give birth to a kitten. If your baby has an intact suck reflex you should use it. It allows the gag reflex to work better. If you feel strongly about the concept of nipple confusion, it's not a thing. Then ask for a SNS system. Tape that tiny tube to a boob and let your kid eat that way. Just feed your baby. Also, this nonsense about how a baby only needs a few drops of milk in the beginning because their stomach is only the size of a walnut. True. 
Their stomach is small, but much like most other stomachs it stretches and empties pretty readily into the small intestine. Plenty of babies eat a full ounce right out the gate. Air. Vag. Lastly, if you have a home birth and your kid ends up coming to the hospital by ems please let us do our job. If you don't want any of the care we offer then please refuse ems. Or don't even call them to begin with. Drink water. Not a doctor but I'm a trauma nurse. Motorcycles are freaking awesome but they are also death machines. Don't ever get on a freaking motorcycle. But if you do anyway, wear a freaking helmet. Not just a helmet but all the proper gear leather jacket, motorcycle pants and shoes. A t-shirt and flip flops will not protect you if you go down. Absolutely avalanched here, but your brain is an organ like any other, susceptible to disease and malfunction. When crap is going awry mentally, it is in absolutely no way different to lungs struggling with bronchitis. Your skin, biggest organ, brain dudes, being overtaken by some weird rash, kidneys or gallbladder pumping out stones. You get the point, I hope. If you've got a brain then you've got mental health to look after too. Bottom line. Just because the output is mainly social doesn't mean the disease disrupting your life isn't as important. Our brains are awesome but also sometimes misguided in how to preserve our well-being. Tell someone. If they don't listen, tell the next person. But the best person to talk to is always a mental health professional. If you don't cinch with them just move on to the next one. No biggie. Your whole body will thank you for it in the long run. My friends. Serious. Doctors of Reddit, what was the worst reaction, happy, in a psychopathic way, or sad, that you have ever gotten from telling someone their loved one is will die? Worked on a medical surgical for a few years at the beginning of my career as a nurse. Sure, we had a few patients here and there that were just there for observation. My first cancer patient I lost in my career seemed like one of those. When he was admitted to our floor, he was always cheerful, polite, and never admitted feeling ill in any way. One of the nicest people you could want to meet. I remember him because of this. Dude had stage 4B lung cancer, and never once asked for anything. Over the course of a few months, I got to know him better. As it turns out, he thought he had a bad cold and found out he was dying shortly. It's crappy, but that's life sometimes I suppose. It ain't always pretty. When he found out, he seemed at peace with it all. Then he began working like a madman from his bed. Every time I went into his room to check on him or give him meds, he was writing in a notebook. Only once did he receive visits whole he was with us, and it was his wife, who was brought by a friend. She never learned to drive because she never wanted or needed to. Dude spent his entire life taking care of her, completely and totally. As it turns out, all the writing in notebooks was him leaving her notes of how to do things. He'd literally taken care of her since they were in high school. She didn't even know how to use a dishwasher. Nothing. I think of him from time to time, when I've had a rough go with love in my life. The times I asked this man about his wife were some of the few times I saw his face light up with delight. It's nice to think that love like that exists. The ones that really stick out are the people who take the news with quiet dignity. Had one patient present with dermatomyositis. 20% of people with this have an underlying malignancy. I told the patient and family this and asked if they wanted to look. They said yes. Did a CT scan. Showed multifocal tumor burden in the liver. Biopsy showed pancreatic adenocarcinoma unfortunately. So mets to the liver equals stage 4. Broke the news to the patient and her family and her response was thank you for telling me. That must have been really hard for you to do. Pancreatic adenocarcinoma seems to always take the most gentle people. Work in orthopedics. Had a car crash involving 7 family members. Youngest was a 9 year old with open fractures to both legs. Rushed straight into theater. But the child had developed rapid onset sepsis. Mixed with some blood lost and a pay. Died on the table before surgery could begin properly. Despite a large number of staff as you can imagine. We couldn't do any more. The father was the last to find out. As suffered a fractured skull and was moved to a different trauma hospital. Crash occurred halfway between the two hospitals. Patients were split up due to rush need at the time. He had a bleed on the brain and was in IQ for a week. Wife didn't tell him until he left IQ out of fear it would set him off in the recovery. I heard when he found out, he self-discharged and attempted suicide. I hope he is alright now and getting help. 
but unfortunately being in a different area it's hard to find out. I believe it was actually his wife that was driving. Finally as a side note, please ensure that your headrest in a car is adjusted correctly. I see a lot of head, skull and neck injuries frequently because of this. Only today I was seeing a fractured C5 because of this. It's something you only have to do once if you're driving the same car all the time, but in combination with a seatbelt it really is there for a reason, not just for comfort. One of my patients had squamous cell carcinoma in situ on his lip that I caught early and was actually removed entirely in the Barsi. We still wanted him to get topical chemotherapy on the area to make extra sure we got everything. For those unaware, it's like a lotion and mostly only has local skin side effects. It was actually good news, but I wanted to reinforce that he's at a higher risk of developing new cancers and it's possible that his children have the same genetic predisposition. So he needs to make sure he and his kids need to be using sunscreen and lip balm with sunscreen at an plus 6 month follow up. He was a native Spanish speaker but his English seemed above average so I didn't want to use a translator if I didn't have to. Well, judging from the years and how upset he was, I guess I misjudged his English skills. He did a good job at picking up the buzzwords. He heard cancer, more cancer, chemotherapy and his children have a higher chance of getting cancer. But he missed all the important context. He thought was going to die and his kids were too. I quickly got a translator and explained everything again. He was still distraught over the emotional roller coaster moments ago but he understood what was going on. So my worst reaction was a wrong reaction because I fricked up. I was working the burn unit. Guy comes in, MVC head on collision the other driver was drunk and crossed lanes. His wife was killed in the crash. Every time he woke up he asked where his wife was, and he had to be told. He would just start saying 42 years and sobbing. I can't imagine what it was like for that guy, having to remember every single time you wake up. He was in a lot of pain, aka lots of dilaudid, which contributed to his confusion. Slowly over time it sank in. Very heartbreaking to watch. Inkton year of residency while working on the vascular surgery service. A page is about an older lady who was being transferred in from an outside hospital with an aortic aneurysm rupture. Aortic aneurysm ruptures have a really poor outcome, but the interesting thing is that while an individual is actively dying from it they are still coherent and not in, relatively, terrible pain. About a couple minutes of me leaving the room, the patient died. Anyways the daughter and best friend arrived, presumably being with her at the other facilities or previously. I took them to a separate room away from all the hustle of the air and let them know. Of course they were surprised because we were just talking to her and she didn't seem to be in that much pain. Both of which are true statements. Aortic aneurysm ruptures really are a relatively low pain way to die, but can be pretty shocking for the loved ones to register in a short amount of time. Alternatively it was the 40 something year old mother of two who had been admitted for nausea and vomiting and died of multisystem organ failure, heart attacks, strokes, ischemic colitis, pulmonary embolism, etc. Because of a rare clotting disorder then decided to manifest itself all that once for the first time in her. Telling a family that someone that young and previously healthy that not only is the mother going to die, but that they should have their doctor look at screening them for a rare condition is no fun. I was at a delivery where both mom and baby were having problems. As we were saving baby the or team was trying to save mom. We did. They didn't. As we were leaving with baby to the NICU the or doc was telling dad and his family that his wife didn't make it. He saw his baby and asked when mom could begin breastfeeding. Grandma fell to the floor crying but dad just had this look like he was just waking up and not hearing what was going on. Seeing him visit the Niku was just so sad. You could see him trying to hold it all in while visiting his baby. Deputy here. I've been to her quite a few deaths and I've only seen one that was happy. The husband was a lifetime alcoholic and was on hospice for various related illnesses. When we arrived he was DOA. She told us he went to go to the bathroom gasped and literally dropped dead. She was at first sad, the more she talked about him we could tell he was a real bastard. She pretty much couldn't make a move without him. He wouldn't let the grandkids come over and they lived next door. When the funeral home came to collect the body they had difficulty getting him loaded up. The wife remarked even dead he still finds a way to be a pain. I couldn't help but grin when she said it. 
Thankfully I wasn't the only one in the room, but we spent 3 hours on and off explaining to her family that we couldn't transfer their deceased child to another hospital. I think they believed the kid was in a vegetative state, and that we just gave up on them, instead of the reality that their kid was dead. My in-laws did this when their daughter was shot in a hunting accident. They were in at a rural hospital and thought if they could get her to a better one she would have survived. I work in Ica so I often have to tell families bad news. The most recent memory was a daughter telling me this must be the hardest part of your job. I was taken back just because despite the tragedy she was enduring, she still had the ability to empathize with what I also had to do. Paramedic here. I have only had one person say that to me throughout my entire career and it stuck with me to this day. I was a med student in a case where an 11 year old child suddenly died during a routine orthopedic procedure for a broken arm. There were about 20 family members there with balloons and stuff. When the surgeon told them the news, they all started screaming and scattered, running in different directions around the hospital. One of them started clawing at me like a zombie. Definitely one of the most disturbing things I've ever witnessed. Previous nursing assistant on a respiratory ward, elderly male patient decided to willingly opt out of respiratory support machine. Lovely man. His time inevitably came around 6 hours later, early in the morning. His granddaughter, young girl around mid-twenties, the only family member in the hospital at the time was so devastated she climbed into the bed with him and wouldn't leave the ward. Endless crying, shrieking and asking for her granddad to wake up. Heartbreaking stuff. Staff and doctors tried to coerce her to take some time outside but she wouldn't leave the bed. Eventually the rest of the family arrived and talked her out but took a good few hours. This was 3 years ago, when I'd recently started training in the hospital, and I was placed in a consultation room for a week. The doctor had told me the next patient had received many treatments for her bowel cancer but the cancer was coming back too fast. There was nothing the hospital could offer her anymore, so that day we were to tell her how she only had an estimated 3 months left to live. They walked in the room and she looked as if she already understood what we were about to say, but the husband was distraught. He was in tears, and I had to do my best to offer advice and comfort as the doctor had already gone back to his paperwork. It was one of the most harrowing experiences I've had in the hospital to date, hearing his desperate pleas of whether there was anything we could do to help. His wife did her best to console him too, but I could see she needed the support too. I'm really sorry I couldn't do anything to help. Old friend, I hope your wife rests peacefully. When I worked in a large inner city of this family had brought in their grandmother who had went to take a nap in the family living room on her family chair. Well when she didn't wake up for 8-10 hours, the family activated Ems and brought her to me. She had been dead for half the day at this point which was very obvious so we called it. The lady was stiff at this point. When I called the family into the room, all 20 of them to tell them their 88 year without a decent organ in her body on dialysis had indeed died they accused me first of lying then second of murdering her. Police had to be called as a particularly boisterous 14 year female was being very threatening and repeating what a lot of families say she was fine this morning. People don't just die. Unfortunately that is how everyone dies. 88 is a long time. If I could sign a contract that would guarantee I would live to 88 but not a day older, I'd sign that crap right now. Kind of unrelated, but was doing my internship on a palliative care ward where we were occasionally supporting patients through the medical assistance in dying process. One wise cracking patient was set to pass away that day. All of the preparations had been made and he had said his goodbyes to his family. There was a bit of a delay and the family had stepped out of the room momentarily. A poor nursing student assumed that the medically assisted death had already been performed and walked into the patient's room. All of a sudden, he sat up in the bed, stared at her and exclaimed, Why aren't the drugs working? She ran out of the room terrified with him cackling in the background. Honestly I don't see how I'd have done differently. In inner city Detroit in the 80s, where I trained a surgeon, mostly knife and gun trauma, it was common for reactions to be violent. The organ procurement nurse was beating up when he spoke with a family member about organ donation. Another time a family member punched and kicked dozens of holes in the walls up and down a corridor. 
two brothers on hearing about the death of their third brother were vowing revenge. I got them to promise not to do it on a night I was on trauma call. The worst were the parents of a young man killed while committing our pay. Not only did they have to deal with the loss of their son, but the circumstances of his death were terrible. A quiet shock. Your son is dead. And was also our pissed. Dang. Best was talking with the family matriarch. Strong businesswoman whose children had taken over several businesses in the town. Very rich influential family. We originally admitted her as a stroke but on further review found multiple brain metastasis. Family wanted everything done. This was a mentally alert woman who at 94 they wanted to have chemo and surgery. I discussed her options with her including no aggressive treatment. She elected for this. She went into hospice and died peacefully a few months later. She asked what I would do. Having just gone through this with my grandmother and grandfather the year before I gave her both sides of the story. Doing everything and buying a few months but dealing with surgery and illness. Or just pursuing comfort measures. I think she was happy with the decision. I think the family was upset with me for giving her that option. Good on you for giving her all the options. Some family just want to hold on and ultimately it's not their choice. I'd rather enjoy 6 comfortable months than 9 in hospitals and being sick. Patient came in for drug OD with her boyfriend. She was stabilized, but a complication caused her to pass. We stood there for a few moments and let him have a moment. He had one of those thousand yard stare looks on his face, and he went full rage. He got on the bed and started beating her, and when I mean beating her I mean close fisted punches on her face and body and kept saying, why, why would you do this to me he called her a selfish bee and some other crap. I can't remember because 8-10 people had to pull him back. He was removed out of the hospital and kept screaming why. That one will always stick out to me. So many traumatic events it is hard to recall all the details or to pick one. But this one was different. No trauma no emergency. We told this friendly guy of his diagnosis that will kill him soon. Weeks to months. Then asked who we should talk to or who can be his guardian. He only had his boss from his recent job. No family, no friends. He was all alone. His boss visited once early on. I thought about that a lot. Still do. So here's a weird one that stuck with me. Had a patient in his 50s die in a single room on the ward while surrounded by his Portuguese family. Mostly women, wife, sisters, in-laws. All in their 40s at least. We knew he was deteriorating and had no plans to resuscitate if and when he died. A few days into his admission he passes away while the family were visiting. I get called in by the nurse to confirm the death and everyone in the room is completely silent and watching me. I confirm what they already know and everyone just mobs me. Hugging me. Kissing my hands. Kissing my cheeks and thanking me profusely for looking after their relative. Not what I was expecting at all. It was like a sudden collective release of tension in the room. Somehow I think they were just relieved he wasn't suffering anymore. I think that was exactly it. You helped their family member in a time of suffering. And now that it's over, they'll thank you. Had a patient who was flown in from far away with a non-survivable accidental burn. The only family member at the hospital was an adult child, who had a very appropriate response when I told them shock, disbelief, sadness, denial, etc. The patient's spouse was still at home, hours away. I called the spouse and told them about the nature of the burn, the need to get to the hospital ASAP to say goodbyes, etc. The response was okay. Thank you doctor. Most people are frantic but this person was completely calm and more concerned about getting the house cleaned up. The patient surprisingly made it through the night and the family brought the spouse to the hospital the next morning. I was able to talk to the spouse and realize that when the patient left the house with the paramedics, the spouse knew that there was no way the patient would survive. I was just confirming what they already knew, that they were losing their partner of almost 40 years. They seemed more concerned about the house because they just couldn't bear to look at the footprints burned into the carpet anymore. I work in a pediatric cancer hospital and once when we were talking to a mother about her 2 year old's daughter's poor prognosis, she said as a mother, all I can really think of now that I'm losing a child is when I can start trying for another one. It was definitely one of the most uncomfortable reactions I've ever heard. I know grief is complicated but I will never forgot because no one in the room knew how to respond. 
This is surprisingly common. A lot of parents that lose babies during labor or in the NICU don't change anything in anticipation of trying again as soon as possible. They leave the nursery intact and the car seat installed. Grief is a complex thing. When I was a pediatrics resident working in the neonatal intensive care unit, a set of twins were delivered way too early. The parents had already given names to twin A and twin B. They both survived delivery, but twin B died overnight. When we broke the terrible news to them, they were appropriately devastated, but the thing that always struck me as weird is what they did next. They decided to switch names so that the twin that lived had the name they liked more. I often think back on the twin that died and how sad that all was. Anesthesiologists, what are the best things people have said under the gas? My 9YO son going under for his MRI that would show if he would need his right leg amputated at a hip. Just as he slipped under, I am a brave boy, I am a brave boy. Dang. Broke me then. Breaks me now typing this. What a kid. He is a brave boy. I had a colonoscopy just last month and the lady who administered the propofol and I had a brief conversation like this. Me. How long is that gonna take to kick in? Her. You'll be out in less than 10. I always win. With a big grin on her face. I started to feel it immediately after that and followed with. You'll never take me down. I then recall laughing like a maniac. Followed by nothing. I think her quip about always winning and obviously the propofol got me good ha ha. I was semi awake during a hand surgery. The only person I could see was the anesthesiologist. I remember telling him some jokes while I lay there. Then I remember hearing the doctor chuckle on the other side of the curtain. Followed by would you put her the frick out then blackness. I often have wondered if my hand would work better now if I weren't so dang hilarious. Not an anesthesiologist but was a tech. Had a patient wake up violently. When he came to he said. Sorry, I thought I was a shark. Happened today. Patient has a broken ankle fixed and was coming out of anesthesia when he was being wheeled out. The anesthesiologist accidentally hit the door frame on the way out. Patient, did you just do surgery on my leg? Anesthesiologist, yes you had surgery and are waking up from it. Patient, then why are you running into things? Fantastic. Not an anesthesiologist but my tight laced, extremely christian great grandma apparently asked who the frick is that ugly son of a bee while she was waking up from a surgery. The person she was referring to, her preacher who stopped by to check up on her, she never lived that one down. The story was even told at her funeral. She was kinda strict but she was a great lady with a great sense of humor. Not gas, but right after giving my dazzlam I had a patient say wow, this feels like the 70s, and have had quite a few old men ask me out on a date before passing out a few seconds later. When I came out of surgery at 14 I told everyone I was fine and just felt like a Gatorade. Mum got it for me, opened the lid and handed it over. I took it and maintaining direct eye contact with her I tipped it upside down nowhere near my mouth. Got Gatorade all over me and was super confused. That's where my memory ends. Mum tells me after looking briefly confused I just shrugged and settled back down to fall asleep. I had surgery last year and when waking up they had a communal room where around 7-8 people would all be waking up at the same time before being sent to individual rooms for some reason. I remember waking up slowly and hearing someone else being asked if they wanted some water. For some reason this really excited me. Like, there was nothing more in the entire world I wanted than to be asked if I wanted water. I practically yelled, or as much as I could yell in that state, Hey, ask me if I want water, and I'm pretty sure it came out in a let me speak to your manager tone. But I was just so excited about the water. Anesthesiologist here. I was once transporting a patient to the IQ after surgery, in which he got some ketamine. And he was rocking out the entire way there with his egg guitar. My anesthesiologist tried to calm me down with a joke when I was a little kid being put under. My mom later told me about how I apparently commented on the joke being not at all funny and how I hoped he was more talented as a doctor. Mine kept telling dad jokes and I apparently said thank god I'm going to be unconscious soon as a critique of his jokes. I was the patient. After I had my wisdom teeth removed, I remember trying to drink some water, spilling it all over myself, and then crying, asking who took my water. 
patient, woke up halfway through a colonoscopy and asked the gastroenterologist if he'd removed the arsegoblin yet. My dad's an anesthesiologist, he was treating a woman, and he said, I'm putting you to sleep now. She replied with the most horrified look on her face, like a dog. I was coming out of general anesthesia after a surgery to repair a broken leg. I woke up in my room with about a dozen very caring, kind friends and relatives who had all come to see that I was okay. I looked around, saw everyone giving shoots about me, said, frick this, loudly and very clearly, and went right back to sleep. My friends thought it was hilarious. My mom was mortified. Backstory, I have epilepsy and a vagal nerve stimulator to control the seizures. It works wonders. From 3 to 4 seizures a week to almost none a year, I went in for the replacement of my device. Going under I looked at my mother and started laughing hysterically. She asked what was funny, I said she had horns. And as I was coming out of all the drugs the nurse was kind of a jackass to me so I said, Oh man the next time I puke I'm gonna puke on you. I did. He said, man your aim is good, I'm not even mad at you. Two of my fav, both patients coming out of anesthesia, am I in heck I responded no you're not, you're just in recovery, that sounds like something the devil would say, I count backwards from 100 to prove it, or the one who stroked my unshaved arm while I was trying to keep him from pulling at his IV, and muttered you'd make such a great carpet, ETA, yikes you people really like hairy arm carpets. I love the implication that the devil can't count backwards. I'm an anesthesiologist. I was recently taking care of a 17 year old kid and he looks at me and says dude, I am high as frick. They almost never remember it afterward. Me after getting my wisdom teeth taken out, nurse warned my mom that I'd probably be saying some crazy crap until I came down fully, which I thought was total bulls, as I was super lucid. Felt like I could walk around fine, and was slightly annoyed, but understood when they loaded me in the wheelchair. They clearly told me that I couldn't eat solid food, how to treat the massive holes in my gums, etc. However I was craving a pop tit, like needed one ASAP, mouth drooling, probably actually bleeding, but whatever, and having in-depth fantasies of going to town on the largest pack I could find. Quite conveniently in the car on the way home, I discovered nothing else but a cookies and cream popped at pack. I'm seriously making sweet mouth love to this pastry, never happier, until I remember I'm not supposed to eat solid foods. I shamefully tell my mom the news, and that she has to take my brief, but delicious love away from me. I specifically remember saying, it's for the greater good, so I'm trying to hand her my pop tart from the back seat, while she is driving on the highway no less. When I realize the pop tart isn't there, the pop tart never existed, besides in my mind. She says, okay, Tolkien, I got to honey, and I reply, the pop tart was fake, wasn't it? I giggled for a bit, then went back to doing whatever the heck I wanted in my head. Fun times, 10 stroke 10 would do again. By the time I had a c-section, I'd been in labor for 36 hours, awake for 48, had pushed for 4 hours and was exhausted and super out of it. I remember the doctor holding up this baby shaped object and I said to my husband, is that the baby? Never mind, it's not. And he said, actually yes that's our baby and then I started arguing with him and telling him I was positive that wasn't the baby and he had no proof it was. Spoiler alert, it was the baby. In high school I had a reconstructive surgery on my knee as I tore my ACL and meniscus in a sports injury. After the surgery I woke up in post-op, which was a fairly large room with probably 6 to 7 other patients in beds waiting to become conscious again. I was lying there all groggy and confused when two nurses walked over pushing one of those carts with a computer on it. They stood over me and were typing into the computer when one nurse said to the other in a sort of frantic whisper we've got to plug this thing in or this one is going to die. Naturally, semi-conscious me thought that the thing was me and I started to incoherently yell for the nurses to unplug whatever they needed to in order to find an outlet to keep me alive. Turns out it was the battery on the laptop that was going to die. Apparently the death rate for an ACL repair is pretty low. We used to call those carts, cows, computer on wheels. But apparently patients don't like it or think we're talking about them so we aren't supposed to anymore. During my wisdom teeth surgery they were playing music, and Billy Jean comes on, 
I said glad Michael Jackson could join us and that was the last thing I remember. My husband went under last year, and once he woke up, by our appearances he was as sober as a church mouse. Walking, asking serious questions of the doctor, apparently no issues at all. He remembered the procedure and described it to me in detail. I figured he just never went completely under. He was craving Chinese food, and nothing would do except for buffet. So we headed down and loaded up our first load of plates. Evidently, he actually woke up from the anesthesia at the buffet. As far as he remembers, he was put under and woke up in front of a plate of chicken teriyaki on a stick. Okay that's wild lol. After getting my wisdom teeth removed I looked at my mother-in-law and said, How did you get on my rocket ship? After my wisdom teeth removal, I woke up babbling about pink Cadillacs. When I was about to go out for surgery, they were strapping me down and told me it was so that I would fall off the table. My last words were, it's okay, 5 second rule. Thank god, after 5 seconds they would have had to toss you. Jeremy the intern though might have kept you though that gross mf. Not an anesthesiologist, but my husband kept telling the medical staff after his procedure that it's okay, my wife's a doctor, she knows what you're talking about, I'm a lawyer. I was the patient, I was getting my gallbladder removed and as they were wheeling me back, I started to cry and said, I'm gonna wake up with my lips stitched to someone's butthole. When I got put under for a colonoscopy I didn't really fall asleep during the countdown. I just looked at the nurse a bit confused and said um, I don't notice anything. And she smiled and squeezed my wrist and said just give it a moment. As soon as she said that I started fading out and according to her the last thing I mumbled was oh that fricked, you magic witch. When they told me to start counting. I apparently counted for 45 seconds before I went out but I only remember the first 10 lol. Last year they were knocking me out for a colonoscopy. It was the third time I had been put under in a year. As such I had a curiosity. I had heard that when they knock you out you are still awake for a while. You just don't remember. So in the spirit of science I proposed a test with the anesthesiologist. When she started the medicine I would begin counting backward. When I would wake up we would compare what I remember to what she observed. Plunger down 99. 98. 97. I remembered nothing more. Minutes later I awoke. The anesthesiologist despised me and came over quickly. What did you remember she asked. 97. She began laughing. You got down to 7. That's awesome. I had a patient start to joke before surgery and finish it when they woke up without prompting. I can just imagine it going like. What do you call a guy w a rubber toe? Hours later. Comma Roberto. I went under for a nasal canal surgery and apparently after the surgery I was holding the nurse's hand and repeating I love you, don't leave me over and over. I had a patient coming out of anesthesia who opened his eyes as I was switching him from a mask to nasal cannula tell me this hospital has the most beautiful women I've ever seen. Made me blush I was so flattered, and made the rest of my day awkward with my co-workers teasing me about it. Whoever you are sleepy man, I simultaneously thank you and hate you. I was given a relaxer prior to colonoscopy and was rolled into the room. Doctor asked me what I had done that weekend. I said I went to the MN State Fair. Oh, she says eat anything interesting. I said why don't you tell me no laughter whatever in the room. And then I was out. I swear she gave an extra shove because I half woke up during the procedure and remember groaning. My cousin had a similar experience before his colonoscopy. They gave him the relaxer and he then started calling his gown his dress and kept trying to cover his butt because it's not time for his close up yet. Not an anesthesiologist. The anesthesiologist that came in to check me over had bright blue teeth and lips. Keep in mind I was high as frick. I asked him how smurfette was last night. I passed out hearing the nurses laughing. My wife is an anesthesiologist and her best line from a patient is this is better than M. Not an anesthesiologist, but I knew a guy who had surgery and afterwards wanted to go home. Just, he wasn't recovered enough to and the nurse wasn't gonna let him get up yet. He turned to the nurse and said, you may not realize this, but I'm a ninja and we heal three times faster than normal people. At that the nurse stopped trying to keep him in bed. He stood and immediately ate the floor. Um, floor. My dad works with that stuff, 
Funniest thing he's heard is hey Mr. Doctor, my butt itches and I'm too high to scratch. I was about to be put under for a colonoscopy while the nurse was trying to position me in a way to make it easiest for them to work. I had my knees to my chest and was passing out from the gas when I asked the nurse to paint me like one of her French girls, then passed out. Still makes me cringe. Funny afro. I was a patient. I went in the getter MRI at 7. They injected me with something and I said, wow that made me really sleepy. Then the doctor said, sucker shouldn't be able to talk. I still haven't told anyone I remember that. I'm pretty sure my mother was in the room, but I dk. Woke up after wisdom teeth surgery alone in a small recovery room. I called out for my mom and dad and when they didn't immediately come to my side, I called out for Captain Kirk. My fiancé and I had broken up within the last week and was still dealing with that horribly. I was on pain meds for my shoulder and was scheduled for surgery in the current week. The day of the surgery, I was to get a nerve block. The anesthesiologist was the one performing the nerve block. He and I were chit-chatting, and he was just a really comforting person. He was telling me about everything that was going to go on during the surgery. Then we were just chit-chatting about life when the topic of the breakup came up. He was even comforting with that. So after that, I was wheeled into surgery. He was there to put me under, which for some reason put me at great ease. As I was going under, I guess I started talking through the mask and he lifted the mask to hear what I was trying to say. When I boldly stated I still love you, Fianke's name, while holding direct eye contact with him. I didn't know I did it. Not until he visited me in recovery. He said thanks for the nickname, then told me what I said. I guess the entire surgical staff referred to him by my fianke's name for the duration of the surgery. So not only did I call this poor guy a woman's name that stuck with him for the duration for the surgery, I stated how much I loved him to boot. When I went back for the second surgery, guess who my anesthesiologist was? Regardless of my foul ups, he is an awesome anesthesiologist and really good at his job. My wife couldn't take me for my first colonoscopy due to work so my mother did, and apparently coming out of anesthesia, when they were removing my IV, I told the nurse, oh, that's neat, I've taken a lot of those out, but I've never had it done to me, and my patients are always dead. Apparently she looked very concerned by this information and my mother had to explain that I've been a licensed funeral director for many years and hospitals and other facilities often do not remove tubing. Apparently I then followed that up by telling the young nurse she had a nice butt, but not as nice as my wife's. My mother felt free to share that with everyone. So yeah, I creeped out a nurse by talking about my occupation, and then even more by commenting on her butt in a backhanded compliment. I broke my hand tumbling once and had to get surgery. He goes to put the mask on my face and says this is oxygen. I cough as the mask goes on. He pulls the mask away and I said I trusted you. You lying freak. That's the last thing I remember. Not an anesthesiologist, but when I severely dislocated and broke my knee I apparently gave one of the doctors that was just finishing resetting my leg a huge slap on the back and yelled it's fixed. You guys are the best doctors I've ever seen. Giving a 5 star review. Wife said the nurses were cracking up. I'm a pretty big guy and the doctor I gave the friendly pat on the back was a relatively small dude. When I had a cavity filled a few years ago, I vaguely remember hugging one of the doctors after waking up. As an added bonus, I apologized to my parents because I didn't think I could drive. I was too young to drive at the time. Nurse anesthetist here. When I was in school I was getting ready to get a lady off to sleep and going through my regular spiel. I had the mask on her face and I said nice big breaths as I pushed proper full. Right before she went out she said thanks. I just had them done. I looked at my preceptor, we looked at the circulator, and we all burst out laughing. I now say slow deep breaths instead. I love telling that story. That lady made all our days. This is hilarious. I could easily see this being on a show like Scrubs. Before my emergency appendectomy and right as they wheeled me away, I grabbed my husband and said, very loudly, don't forget to tell them our backup plan. If this crap goes south, I want my legs and arms removed so you can carry me around in a backpack. The student doctor accidentally wheeled me into the wall cause he was laughing so hard. 
you have been visited by the party pug he just wants you to celebrate with him. Comment woohoo to celebrate with the party pug. Thanks for watching. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Or don't. Either way, have a great day you magnificent people.